if you uh, cannot hear me, then maybe you can just mention that in the chat. But I'm hoping that I am audible. Uh, so here, oh yes, thank you so much for giving me that affirmation. Yes. Uh, so yes, in the class, if anyone could open for a you know with a word of prayer and commit this entire class into the Lord's hands. Uh, anyone willing to do that for us? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father, for this day, for this time, Father. We, Father, as we're going to start our classes, Father, we ask for your wisdom, for your understanding, Father. Uh, teach us through Pastor Deepika, Father, Holy Spirit, pour out your wisdom upon her. And Father, whatever we learn, Father, we'll be able to apply in our lives, Father. We thank you in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Thank you so much. Yes. So we will begin with our class today. Um, we will be looking at the last of the wisdom books today. So last class, we looked at Ecclesiastes. I hope that you uh, know those of you who are here in the class logged in and uh, were part of the class. So uh, today we will be looking at the very last wisdom book, Song of Solomon, very briefly. And then we will move into the prophetic books. The very first prophetic book that we see is Isaiah. So we will be looking at that as well. Uh, so to conclude with the wisdom books, the last of them in our uh, you know English arrangement of the books is Song of Solomon. So if you were to open in your Bibles to the Song of Solomon, the very first chapter and the very first verse, uh, this is the introduction that we see about the book where it says Solomon's Song of Songs. So over there it... Um, attributes this particular book to Solomon. And uh, so we can understand this opening statement in two ways. We can either think of it as, uh, um, uh, when, when we say Solomon's song, we can think of it as a song about Solomon, or we can think of it as a song written by Solomon. So which one would be the correct way of understanding this introduction? Is this a song that is written about Solomon, or is this a song which is being written by Solomon? Um, if we were to, I mean, uh, look at some of the verses which come, you know, later on in this in this song, we observe that it's not really talking about the man Solomon because the man Solomon was not loyal or faithful to any one single wife. He had uh, multiple wives. So, but this book talks about an exclusive marriage relationship where one man is entirely committed to one wife and the wife is completely committed to her husband. That is what this book is talking about. But we don't see that in the life of Solomon. So it's probably uh, you know, likely that Solomon writes this at the end of his life in his old age when he understands the value of an exclusive commitment to one single person, you know, during her entire lifetime. So it's more likely that Solomon has written the book, uh, but it is not talking about his own life. Um, if we were to look in, you know, um, Song of Solomon, chapter 2, verse 16, the woman who is generally referred to uh, as the Shulamite woman, because she is from a place called Shunam, and so she's generally referred to as the Shulamite. And that's basically how we will be referring to her uh, you know, during our class. So this lady, the Shulamite, this is what she says in chapter 2, verse 16. She says, my beloved is mine and I am his. Okay, so she says that this beloved of hers belongs to her and her alone. But then in the case of Solomon, we see that he did not belong to one person. Um, in fact, this is the detail which is given about him in Song of Solomon itself, in chapter 6, verses 8 to 9, it says that this man Solomon had 60 queens, 80 concubines, and it goes on to say virgins beyond number. So he does not belong to any one person in any sense of the term. Okay, so when, she, when this Shulamite says, my beloved is mine and I am his, she's definitely not referring to Solomon. So whom is this book actually talking about? When Solomon wrote this song about two persons, about the Shulamite and her beloved, whom was, she talk whom was he talking about? Who was this beloved person 
of the Shulamite. Um, now, when we look at Song of Solomon, chapter 1, verse 7, here the Shulamite is speaking to somebody, and this is the question that she is asking him. So, in SOS uh, 1 7, if you were to look, it says over there, Tell me, O oh, you whom I love. So, you know, this, here the Shulamite is very clearly speaking to her beloved, and this is what she says. She says, she, she asks, Tell me, O oh, you whom I love where you feed your flock, where you make it rest at noon, for why should I be as one who wails herself by the flocks of your companions? So she's asking him a question. She's, she's asking him, where do you feed your flock and where do you make your flock rest at noon time, you know, when the heat becomes very great and all the sheep need to rest? So she's asking him this. She would definitely not ask this of a king a king does not go, you know, sit around on the mountain, uh, uh, you know, um, feeding his, grazing his sheep. So here she's talking to a shepherd. And uh, so this is the proposition which is, you know, placed before us that probably this song was written by Solomon. But in this song, he's talking about the Shulamite and her beloved, who is a shepherd. So the story is not about the Shulamite and Solomon. The story is about Shulamite and the shepherd that she has committed herself to. Uh, however, you know, when, when, we, when we start looking at the very first chapter of uh, Song of Solomon, we see that in the very opening verses, she's thinking about her beloved. And uh, so she over there, she's thinking about this shepherd person. However, where is she talking about, you know, from, from where is she saying these verses? We discover in uh, verse 1, uh, in chapter 1, verse 4, she says, the king has brought me into his chambers. So she's talking from the royal uh, palace. But even though she's sitting in the royal palace of Solomon, she's thinking about her beloved who is the shepherd. So which indicates to us, that, you know, in the same way, these kings used to collect all the women that they, you know, are interested in and bring them to their harem. The same way Zeres did, you know, King Zeres in the, in the story of Esther, we see that uh, his officials, they go throughout the land and they collect all the women with whom, you know, the king probably would be interested in. So this is something which the, uh, this, is a, this, is a, this is one way in which the kings exploited their position in those days where they would randomly collect the people that they are interested in and bring them in like cattle, you know, as the women are just somebody to be used. So this is what we see. So here it looks as though Solomon brings this lady as well, you know, along with um, other people to his harem. And even though she has been brought over here, and even though there is a chance for her to become a concubine, you know, which can be quite a wealthy position, a comfortable position, she continues to hold on in her heart to the commitment that she has made to the shepherd. And uh, so later, in fact, we see this in the last chapter of Song of Solomon, chapter 8, verse 7. This is what she says about love. In verses 6 and 7, she's talking about love. And this is what she says. She says in uh, 8, 7, many waters cannot quench love. Rivers cannot sweep it away. If one were to give all the wealth of one's house for love, it would be utterly scorned. So in a way, she's saying, you know, even if you give me all the wealth of the world, it wouldn't take away the love which and commitment which I have in my heart towards the person, you know, who is my beloved. So Solomon was unable to purchase her, buy her with fancy gifts and wealth. She says all the wealth in the world, you know, it's, it's just, you know, the person who really loves someone will just scorn it. They will despise the wealth. They will not even bother to look at it. So um, in this chapter 8, verses 6 and 7 is where you have the main core, you know, the, or the, or of the book where, where it gives a description of what true love is, what true commitment is. So... Um, throughout this book, this is the kind of commitment and love which is, you know, recommended to the readers. 
So, um, especially in those times, um, among the common people, uh, marriage is something, uh, a, a kind of transaction which is undertaken between two families. So two families want to have some kind of a, uh, maybe a business arrangement. They give their daughter in marriage to the uh, boy of the other household. So it was, it had become more like a transactional institution, you know, rather than an institution, um, the way God instituted it to be, it had become more like a business transaction. And even in our today's world, we see that, right? When marriages are sometimes um, arranged for financial reasons, for, um, um, you know, for financial gain, for to form some kind of partnerships between two families. So in a time like that, this book was written to show people that there's more to marriage than just a transaction. In this book, God wanted to show people that this is what he had in mind when he instituted marriage. He expected the man and woman to actually care for each other and love each other and actually enjoy each other. Not just a transaction that you enter into for the sake of convenience, but he expected an actual relationship to develop between the man and the woman. And especially if you look at the culture of those times, you know, the interaction between the husband and the wife was very minimal. In the sense, at least today, you know, when, when the husband comes back home and the wife returns back from her office, they all sit together. I mean, there's some kind of interaction. Back then, you know, when the, when, when the men would be in, in a separate tent and then, you know, you have the, the women in, in uh, separate tents or, you know, uh, quarters, uh, the women would all be in one portion of the house and the men would be in another portion of the house. And so the interaction actually between the husband and wife would be, was, was very minimum in those days. The, um, the, the, the lady would barely know her husband. And when he, when he, when he comes back home, what would he want to talk about? You know, he would want to talk about, uh, the sheep and, you know, his place of business and, you know, money matters. And if he talks to her about those things, she'll probably not understand because her life is, you know, in a completely different realm. So in a culture where there was almost no interaction within the marriage, this, the scriptures are placing before people, before the Israelites, an institution of marriage which was very um, new to them, where God was saying, you know, I did not institute marriage for financial reasons or for some kind of transaction. It is meant to be an actual union between man and woman, where they have a you know, covenant between them and where they are actually committed to one another and this love and loyalty between them. So this was a very new concept, in fact, that God was placing before the Israelites. And God uses a man like Solomon to write that because maybe, you know, by the end of his life, he repented and understood what he had done to himself, you know, through all of those multiple political arrangements and uh, political alliances and marriages and all of that. So maybe he had come to his senses and God uses this man who, you know, who has repented to write this book about a Shulamite who actually is not from a wealthy background. You know, she's from, uh, she, she, she talks about herself in, in, um, chapter one itself. Yeah. She, she talks about how, you know, her, her brothers used to make her work in the fields and because of that, her skin had become very dark. And she was not attractive the way the other women are attractive. And yet, you know, once she makes a commitment to the shepherd, she holds on to that. Even though she's taken to the royal harem of, um, of uh, Solomon, she's not swayed by the riches. She holds on to her commitment. And so in uh, so SOS uh, 8, 6, this is what it says over there. Uh, you know, the Shulamite is speaking to her beloved and she says, Place me like a seal over your heart, like a seal on your arm. For love is as strong as death, its jealousy unyielding as the grave. It burns like blazing fire, like a mighty flame. She uses the imagery of a seal. You know, we are familiar with those, you know, uh, seals of ancient times where you would have the, uh, the, the, you know, the, the, the inscription, the logo of that household on a, you know, uh, engraved on a seal. And then for uh, official purposes, when a document has to be signed, 
you know they would pour hot wax onto the document and then the seal is taken and pressed into the hot wax so the engraving the logo of that household is literally imprinted upon the wax so now she's saying you know you uh, she's saying to her beloved you place me like a seal over your heart and like a seal over your arm the heart is basically the seat of all your emotions so she's saying you know you need to imprint me upon your heart imprint me upon your emotions and she says also seal me on your arm the hand the hand basically symbolized the actions of the person you know the the power and strength and uh, the things which he would do so she says not only imprint me on your emotions also imprint me on your actions on your actions and the choices which you make and the decisions which you take so basically she's saying i need to be an integral part of your life not just someone you know who's just there on the outskirts as someone just to be used no but uh, let me uh, uh, let me be imprinted upon your life not just your uh, on your uh, heart but also on your hand and then she goes on to describe uh, love and um, uh, yeah we'll we'll get to that in a moment um but look at uh, the wording which is there in verse um chapter 7 verse 10 in verse uh, chapter 7 verse 10 there's an interesting statement that is made um you know which kind of takes us back to genesis chapter 3 verse 16 if you remember when we had covered uh, the book of genesis uh, we talked about how uh, 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 because of the fall because of the sin which you know adam and eve commit this is what god says to the woman the lord says to her your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you and over there we looked at that word desire and we looked at how it's talking about a desire to dominate to control the man wants to control his wife the wife wants to dominate over her husband so uh, and we looked at the that how that word is used in the in the with reference to cain and all of that so we don't have time to get back into all of that but here that is the wording that was used over there you know the woman's desire is to dominate over her husband but then he will rule over her this competition between them rather than unity but here when you go back to the song of solomon and look at the way marriage is actually supposed to be in sos 710 she um um she, the shulamite says i belong to my beloved and his desire is for me whereas competition had come in between husband and wife here the beloved is willing to place her interests first and so that is the kind of you know um um a kind of marriage which is presented to us even in the new testament you know in in ephesians where the husband is told you know to take into interest uh, to to take into consideration the interests of his wife rather than you know thinking about only his interests so his desire should be for her rather than you know desire for his own interests his own selfish gain so we see that uh, in this song of solomon the right values are once again being established regarding the marriage relationship coming to another one point um in uh, chapter 8 uh, verse 6 where uh, you know the shulamite is describing love and she says that love burns like a blazing fire like a mighty flame okay so different translations have different wordings for this where it talks about you know love burning like a mighty flame uh, but if you look in um, the actual hebrew wording the hebrew wording basically has just one single phrase over there it says love burns like a blazing fire and then you have one hebrew term uh, which is basically uh, shalhebet uh, shalhebet ya okay shalhebet ya shalhebet is flame ya you know is yahweh literally the term means the flame of yahweh you know the fire of yahweh so that is the way yahweh loves so in the same way yahweh loves the the partners in a marriage are supposed to love one another you know with with the, with the flame of yahweh 
with a with a with a burning love which Yahweh has for his people. And uh, in fact, God uses this imagery for himself in both the uh, New Test Old Testament and New Testament. In Isaiah 54, 5, um, this is what it says in Isaiah 54, 5. It says, For your maker is your husband, the Lord Almighty is his name. So over there, the, the Yahweh actually describes himself as the husband of Israel. So he loved Israel with that kind of a love, with that kind of a commitment, where even though they were unfaithful to him, he kept going back to them. You know, he, he took their interests into consideration rather than just thinking about his own interests. In the same way, we see even in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25, um, where it says, husbands love your wives just as Christ loved the church. So that's the reason why the Song of Solomon is also used allegorically. When, when we take the book literally, it's of course talking about the marriage relationship. But when you take it allegorically, it's also referring to the kind of relationship that Yahweh had with Israel in the past and the, you know, the, uh, the love which Yahweh now has with uh, the true Israel, you know, all the Jewish people who have become believers and also all of us Gentiles who are believers, the true Israel of, of Christ. Uh, so um, the, the same way that God loves his church today and in the same way God loved the Israelites back then, in that way, in that manner, in that selfless manner, the partner's inner marriage are supposed to love one another and be committed towards one another. So um, these are just some important points which we could very briefly touch upon from the Song of Solomon. Uh, we will move into the book of Isaiah. So basically, we are now moving into a completely new section. We are looking at the prophetic books. Uh, so if you can just excuse me for a minute, I think I would need to start a new recording. <laughs>